Welcome to the Guns and Gavel Show, where Arizona's self-defense and firearms attorney, Tim Forshe, weighs in on the delicate balance between the law and personal protection. Learn about the legalities and realities of self-defense as he dives deep to discuss firearms laws, legal use of force, concealed carry, and home defense training. The Guns and Gavel Show starts in 3, 2, 1. Hi folks, Tim Forshee here again, and uh, wow, today I've got a real treat for you. I've got a double header lined up. So I've got my old friend John Correa here sitting in the studio with me, and by remote we've got uh, my new friend, a gentleman I'm truly honored to meet, Stephen Williford. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with his name. Uh, I get a chance to talk to both of these guys at the same time. It's going to be a really, really interesting time for me. I couldn't be happier. So, uh, Stephen, I, I've, I've met John before, so I've, I've cut a lip to him before, but I've got to tell you, it's an honor to meet you. I think that you're, you're truly one of those few folks that we can honestly call a hero, and I'm not saying that to make you feel awkward. I know that you would, you're the kind of person that a true hero doesn't like hearing that, but uh, I feel like I need to say it anyway. So thank you for taking the time to be here today, and, and thank you for what you've done for folks in this country. Thank you for having me on. My pleasure. So, um, Stephen, I'm going to ask John to sort of pipe in. I know you guys have met before. I've never had the pleasure. So I'm sure John will have some questions that he can kind of keep my rudder going straight in the canal here. But I just had a couple things I want to talk to you about. I, I, I'm, I've, I've actually watched so many of your interviews, and I know that you have told this story probably, you know, thou, maybe, certainly hundreds of times, I'm sure. And I don't want to put you through that again. I don't, frankly, I don't want to put myself through it. This is one of those stories, I think, if we start getting into it, that I'll probably start crying on camera, and then my daughters will make fun of me even more than they already do. So I'm going to assume people are familiar with the basics of your story. Uh, and if they're not, then you need to look up Stephen Williford on, uh, on YouTube and, and see some of his interviews and get all this. I don't think we need to go back over that today. But I just had some questions that I haven't heard you answer uh, in other interviews, if that'd be okay. Would that be all right, sir? That would be excellent. Okay, well, yeah, you would know until I, I ask, right? I'm sure he's going, oh, thank God. I yeah. don't have to answer the same questions right? exactly. 47 times. <laughs> well, I hope he'd feel that way. I would never know, but yeah. Um, well, actually, when people ask me to go over the story, in some ways it's therapeutic because I think I'm making yeah. a difference in other people's lives. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah it has. It has. Um, I, I guess I would just ask you a couple things uh, that, that, are, that are important to me and I think maybe are important to other people. And, and uh, again, you know, we're talking about an incident that happened on, I believe, November 5th, 2017. It's been a little bit over five years now. And other than everybody and his uncle bugging you for these kind of interviews, okay, which I can imagine, how's your life changed? Well, I now work for Gun Owners of America. Please, uh, uh, shameless plug here. Uh, go to gunowners.org and sign up. We fight for your rights to keep and bear arms because uh, that's paramount. And, you know, if I had not had the ability to own an AR-15 that day, uh, the guy had on class three body armor and a ballistic bulletproof helmet. And when I run across the street to engage a shooter with a pistol, I may have lost that gunfight. How are you? How are you doing? Oh, I'm the most blessed man in this world. I have a at. beautiful wife that I've been married for 34 years to. I have three children, and each one of my three children have got two children of their own. So I have six grandbabies and one on the way, the oldest of which is four years old. Great. Well, sounds like you're getting on with life really well. That's fantastic. Family's everything. So, uh, again, I know you've talked about the, the actual incident itself multiple times. Just sort of a blanket question I would ask. Um, I, I guess I wanted to say, if you had the gift of time travel, and if you could travel back, what would you do different? Obviously, if you had the gift of time travel, you'd travel back and you'd keep any of this from ever happening. But um, yeah, in other words, what would you do different? Maybe it's a better way to ask it. What do you do different now in case, God forbid, something like this should ever occur in your life again? How are you better prepared to deal with it now than you were back in 2017? Well, real honestly, and, and I talked to the United States Senate about this very thing because they were trying to pass a safe storage act, mm -hmm. forcing you to lock all your guns away. And I, I, I truly believe that if you're a responsible gun owner, uh, that you know your own situation and you make sure that your guns are safe from unauthorized use, for sure. But I don't think that there should be a law to force you to keep them in a safe. That day, You're I... You're talking uh, to the, the world's best libertarian right here. Certainly agrees speaking with Speaking my language. <laughs> that, that day, I had to go to my safe and open my safe and grab a magazine and grab a rifle and pop open a box of ammunition 
and stuff eight rounds in it as I hit it for the door. Uh, if I could change anything, because I timed it before I went to talk to the Senate. And I timed it several times in my fastest time to be able to open up the safe, grab a magazine, grab ammunition, and stick eight rounds in it. It took me 91 seconds more wow. than what it would have had I had a rifle at the ready and ready to go. And so nowadays I have a gun at the ready and I make sure that uh, it is safe from unauthorized use. But I had been burglarized a few years before this happened. And the burglar got the one gun that I didn't have in the safe. And for two months, I was afraid of coming home and meeting the same burglar in my house. But this time he had my gun. Yeah. So I made it a habit of unloading and putting away all my guns in a safe. And, um, and I guess excuses are excuses, but if I would have been able to get to my gun quicker, I could have said Well, and maybe having a, a gun that's staged, right? Having one that, yes, this is my defensive firearm, maybe in something that's a quick access safe or something, because those are both problems we want to work on, right? We don't want our guns to get stolen. Somebody breaks in our house, but we want them ready if we need to defend life. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I, I um, remember I, I shot a, a, a rifle match uh, several years ago, and this particular stage in the rifle match, we had to start with loose ammunition in a bucket, and we had to load our magazine and then start shooting on the clock. And... Normally, that's not a task that is that daunting, but a little bit of adrenaline on board, I can only imagine the amount of adrenaline you had on board. It's just in a competition, I remember my hands were shaking, rounds were falling out. I was probably getting one out of every three in the magazine. It took me way longer than 91 seconds to load that magazine. And uh, I guess, yeah, to me, I would say maybe I would have learned that I would try to keep a loaded magazine. Like John said, maybe a staged firearm, but uh, is that sounds like now, that's something you've done as well. That's something I do, absolutely. I yeah. keep a loaded yeah. firearm at the ready. Uh, and I don't, I don't keep it where young people can have access. I have grandchildren, uh, but it, it definitely I will not be caught the way I was that day again. And if you can imagine the, the grabbing the gun and running in and fr trying to get it, ammo in it, and the whole time you can hear gunshots. Yeah, I can uh, only imagine. And, I, and again, I don't want to ask you about that because I don't want you to revisit that part of this. All I would say is, and again, as a, a person that just met you as an outside, I've been following your story for years. Um, all I can say is, oh my God, did you do an amazing job under the circumstances? You clearly did the best you could do and thank God you were there. I mean, barefoot, well, loading your gun as you run, who, who could do any better than you did? No one. So I, what really that's, my, that's my opinion. I really truly believe because I, I believe that God trained me for that moment because I used to be on a church pistol team. We called ourselves the Sinners. And we used to compete as a team of five. And one of our Sinners was a former Army Ranger and a San Antonio police officer. And during, in between our shooting competitions, we would uh, train together. And for three weeks straight, he trained me what to do if ever confronted with body armor. And why would a plumber have needed to know what to do if ever right. confronted with body armor? Right. But now and you know. I, I, yeah. I was trained specifically for a moment. Right. Uh, this is an odd question under this circumstance, because here I'm interviewing you. But um, what lessons have you learned about dealing with the media? I mean, the one thing it seems to me is that I, I don't think I found a news report that has done anything other than praise you. I, even CNN called you a hero. And that, that made me feel so good that even the press that we don't normally expect to, to be good was good. But how did you deal with even the good press? You must have had people camped out in your front yard and following your every move. How, how did you deal with that? I actually couldn't even leave my house for about oh. two weeks after the shooting because there were people in, in my front yard. The sheriff's department put up tape and uh, told any media that came into my yard that they would be charged with... Uh, trespassing that their footage would be taken and destroyed and uh so for a very long time after the shooting i didn't talk to i talked to nra tv mm -hmm. because i thought that they would be friendly to me and then the washington post told a flat lie 
said that the NRA got finally got their good guy with a gun and that I had a note on a chair that said, my time's worth money. If you're not paying, I'm not talking. Oh, and that was a flat lie. I didn't ever tell them that I wanted money or anything else. And I just went, wasn't talking to them, but they lied about me because I wouldn't talk to them. And then that brings up exactly why I didn't want to talk to them. If they would do that to me, then of course I didn't want to speak with them. Yeah. And so, and fairly recently uh, during a gun debate, CNN actually wanted to do an interview with me, wanted me to be the positive part of their, or the pro-gun end of the interview. And I told them I'd do the interview, but I wanted my own video guy to video it also. And they said, well, why would you want that? I said, because y'all haven't been proven to be very friendly. They said, we're always fair and balanced. Oh, and I said, when did that policy change? <laughs> And, and, and no, then I said, that I, would, I said, did, I would have you, my video. Did you go through with the interview? Well, uh, when I told them that I was going to video it also, and I said, I wouldn't show it unless uh, I needed to, they backed out of the interview. <clears throat> I've done similarly and they did similarly. It tells you a lot. So, it? You, know, you don't have to give someone an interview. I mean, right. it's not like I'm a hound looking for, the uh, recognition or anything else. If you want to do an interview with me, you know, if, if you're CNN, I'll do an interview with you, but you're going to have to do it on my terms and not your own. Good for you. So I'm a criminal defense attorney and I get clients every once in a while that want to hold a press conference or they want to give an interview from jail or they want to, they want to go on social media and tell their version of the story. And I'm one of those guys, to me, no comment is not a good answer. I, to me, no comment means I'm not responding. Not that I'm going to say no comment. I'm just not big on that at all. But it's important, I think, especially if you're the one involved, as you were, that somebody's helping you oversee that, right? Did you have anybody helping you to weed out the interviewees, or the interviewers, rather? Did you have anybody that kind of helped you craft the story at all, or were you all on your own? Uh, well, I was all on my own for a very long time, and then a... A few lawyers came forward saying they wanted to represent me. I hope I never pro had bono. A, pro bono. Thank yes. you. And I, interviewed, I did interview with some lawyers. I interviewed one. And uh, can I give her name? Sure. Uh, so it, her name was uh, Pamela Thompson. And when I went into her office and I interviewed with her, I walked out and I said, uh, and my cousin looked at me and said, she scares me. And I said, she scares me too. And that's why she's the one. And that's good. And, yeah. uh, and she absolutely handled, the only thing okay, I wait, needed. Stephen, what, what scared you about her? What, why was she scared? I got to hear that. Yeah. Because that's not what you'd normally hear. Like, <laughs> was she... I, you know, and I just don't know how she did it, but when she walked in a room, she owned that room. And, and you know, she was very well-spoken, very, very good-looking, you know, uh, lady about my age and stuff. And she could just walk into a room and there's something about she owned the room. Mm -hmm. And Charisma. Uh, she, huh? Charisma, Charisma right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I also think sometimes that because uh, I, you know, I had some issues when my parents died and with dealing with the land and stuff, I, I hired the nicest lawyer that I knew in my life. And he's still a great Christian, nice guy, and he screwed everything up, you know. And, <laughs> well, especially when uh, you got somebody who's going to going to be protecting you, right? You want them to have an edge. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, in some ways, I, I think that a lawyer, uh, I look at what they drive to see whether uh, I think they should, do. well, she drove a Cadillac Escalade and a Ferrari, you know, and so I'm like, oh, Tim, Tim you know, good. How's your Ferrari uh, doing? Well, my Ferrari, for me to get into my Ferrari, I have to actually be in a blender, and then they pour me in, <laughs> even, so, yeah, you won't, you won't see me in a Ferrari, sadly, so. And that wraps up another episode of Guns and Gavels. Join us next time to learn more about the legal use of force, personal protection, and firearms training. Show your support and hit the like and subscribe buttons to make sure you never miss an episode. Till next time, stay safe.